motion be agreed to? Madam Speaker. I call the Honourable Paula Bell. Well, yes. Madam Speaker, hello, fiscal whole. Take a bow, Stephen Joyce. The previous speaker, the Minister of Finance, the Honourable Grant Robertson, should have started his speech with, I am sorry to Stephen Joyce and to the National Party who pointed out exactly where we would be at this time. And I can't help but uh, quote directly um, by uh, Cameron Bagri, who said, I don't like the term fiscal hole. Good policy should dominate over strict debt tar targets and economic cycles come and go, which are often beyond government control. But the Labour-led government's fiscal hole is looking deeper by the day and bigger than the $11.7 billion of additional borrowing that Joyce identified." End quote. This government is not taking business concerns seriously, and they simply have to stop dismissing them. They don't understand for business, it is the unknown. Business don't know what is coming, and they got nothing out of that, out of this budget. Business don't know what's coming. Hell, the government doesn't know what's coming. Here we have working group after working group after working group out there, over 100 working groups, and they are looking at everything from tax to industrial relations to, I mean, you name it, to the environment, to climate change, you name it, they are looking right across, and businesses don't know what is coming next. They also don't know what dodgy deal will be done between the Greens and Labor and New Zealand First to get the next piece of legislation over the line, and that unpredictability is doing real damage to business. Real damage to business. You should take this really seriously, Mr Farfoy, because actually this means jobs for New Zealanders. Actually, this means whether or not a business goes out tomorrow and employs another person. When they don't know what will be delivered to them by the current government through the budget they've just seen, through, as I say, more than 100 working groups, through deals that have to be done with parties that have pretty much nothing much in common and have to do a dodgy deal, there is uncertainty. And uncertainty in the real world means jobs. And uncertainty means that someone, and I am, I'm going to take the, the great electorate of Upper Harbour. So each electorate has its little claim to fame. Upper Harbour, its claim to fame is, and I want to quote it particularly, is their claim to fame is they have the highest number of people who own their own home with a mortgage. So what they care about is business confidence. What they care about is their ability to pay those mortgages. They are my tradies done good. They worked for decades. They saved their money. They took risks in their businesses, and now they've bought good homes, and they're doing quite well. But they've got big mortgages. And they care about those jobs. They care about their business. And they do not like the unpredictability that they are currently saying. You've got to say with the deals that are going on, and you can see, I mean, principles are out the window. So we no longer have principles driving place people like the Greens. Well, I've got to say, I never agreed with that often, but I actually did admire them for standing by what they believed in, what they stood on, and their own core principles. Well, they're gone now if they have to do a dodgy deal with New Zealand First to try and get something over. But as the Deputy Prime Minister often likes to say, I believe, and often quite in private, but this is the cost of being in government. Well, the cost of being in government shouldn't be people's livelihood and their jobs. It shouldn't be business confidence crumbling like we're currently seeing. Um, it's obvious that the current government doesn't know what to do, as they've actually you know, almost contracted out the role of governing to the working groups. But they have to take seriously the fact that businesses are losing confidence and, as a consequence, are not spending the same in their own businesses and looking at taking on new people.
I want to talk about things like, I mean, let's just do the list, but um, strikes and the expectations of the public sector. So they were raised by both Labor and the Greens um, during uh, last year. So they raised expectations within the public sector that they would be getting double-digit pay increases on a percentage basis. Um, and that might be the right thing. They can't deliver on those promises now, and we didn't see that in this budget. We did not see money put aside for serious public service. So we haven't even started addressing doctors or uh, 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 secondary school um, uh, teachers. We haven't got to police yet. While we're on police, we didn't see in this budget the funding for the extra 1,800 police right. that we were repeatedly promised right. during the coalition and during the deal, and it's even in the document. So they haven't actually funded them. All they've done is taken the funding that National had already put in, the extra funding for extra police but there's no funding for them, so they're not able to deliver on that. But the effect that now we're seeing on the public sector around the broken promises is we've got literally parents now having to take days off work tomorrow because those teachers are on strike. Take some responsibility for it. We didn't see it in this budget, and we're not seeing it being taken seriously from this current government. And I think that's really serious. It's the effect of those pay increases into the private sector. So what does it mean for them? Well, we don't hear those recognitions from this government. We don't see those recognitions in the budget. So anything from strikes to pay increases to the questions around industrial relations that are dismissed and made jokes of in this House, but actually have very real concerns for the business sector as they're moving forward. Tax more, spend more, borrow more. That's what we saw in this budget. And some will say on spending, it is time. In fact, I might say on some of the spending, it is time. And if that spend had only gone to education and to health, like was promised so much, but what you would call this budget is, if anything, in education and health, it was ordinary. Ordinary. There was nothing extraordinary, there was nothing extra. We saw the big announcement last week of the Prime Minister coming back for a first week after leave to make that big, big mental health announcement of six units. Six mental health units. Take, and let's remember this, they took $100 million out of mental health, $100 million out of mental health, and then they've added six units. Well, I tell you what, that's shameful. That's the big announcement that we saw last week. Um, and yes, we did hear mere murmurings from the Labour government, you know, in the back bench going, this is actually a bit embarrassing if this is the best that we can kind of do. What we did see on the spending was not the spending in education, not the spending in health. What we saw it on was on fees free. Yeah, but, but by the way, Treasury in this budget forecasting fewer tertiary students into the future. So not more, they are literally saying fewer students in the future. We saw the provincial slush fund, as we all know, and boy, are we seeing a lack of process in how that is spent. Um, I've got to say, the regions are literally laughing, laughing. They go, well, we'll take our wee bit. Why wouldn't we? But uh, actually, you know, what will be dished out and how it will is anyone's guess on the particular mood of the day. What we're also seeing, of course, is the more diplomats and the spending in the Pacific Islands. And one might argue that there's merit in that, but at the cost of education, at the cost of our teachers, at the cost of what is needed in mental health, I don't think so. And I think the spending in this budget is completely out of whack with the realities of A, what was promised last year repeatedly, the expectations that have been, been built up, and where they've actually landed. So if this was a budget that was serious about New Zealanders, a bit of advice. Start taking business seriously. Start listening to them. Start recognising that what happens in business actually affects everyday New Zealanders' lives.
They need to be able to afford that minimum wage increase. They need to be able to take on the extra people. They genuinely want to, but they need a government that is predictable. They need a government they can trust. They need a government that will stand up for them. And secondly, spend where you said you would. Put your money where your mouth is when it comes to education, when it comes to health. And we didn't see this, that in this budget, and it's deeply disappointing. I call the Honourable David Clark. Madam Speaker, I think that member might have been reading last year's budget.